I remember those of you that logged on, it looked like more than five or six just logged on. So um, this is meant for educational purposes only. Thanks for joining me. We will have time for questions. So go ahead and type your questions in the chat box, uh, raise your hand and so forth. The questions will be read at the end and then the answers will be uh, answered audibly so that for the recording for the future. Also, try not to share anything private. This is not HIPAA protected, uh, but I do encourage questions. All right, so our topic uh, number one out of the series of six is uh, detoxification. It's a popular subject, um, but I want my family members, my SALT members, um, and those of the people that I interact with to really have some uh, intelligent conversations when they're out in the public with their family or with you know their, their friends and they're talking about this subject. I think that uh, sometimes we are misled and there's a lot of Mm, misinformation out there. So hopefully this helps clear up some of that and also teaches you a little bit about um, what we mean when we say biotransformation. So I just threw out a new word. Biotransformation is actually what most people are, are referring to when they think, oh, I'm going to detox. It's, you know, been holidays. It's now January. I'm going to clean up my diet. I'm going to maybe go sit in the sauna and sweat it out. I'm going to just get clean. Well, <clears throat> what they think of when they do that is they're thinking about getting rid of toxins that maybe have built up over, you know, the holiday season from the alcohol and from the late nights and the sugar and so forth. But actually, when you say detox or detoxification in the medical world, you're going to get some big wide eyes or a lot of eye rolling from your uh, physicians because in our world, that really means that you are clearing out toxins uh, that you have ingested. So drugs, alcohol are the two primary ones. So the better word, I'll go back to it really quick, is biotransformation. You're changing something, your biology is changing or transforming a molecule. That's what we're talking about today. So because you guys are all smart and savvy and uh, part of my family member, that I would like you to use biotransformation. So we'll use it back and forth because it's now you know, and we understand the context, but if you're out talking to your friends or family or you're talking to a clinician, try to use the word biotransformation so they don't roll their eyes or scoop back from you and think that you're talking a bunch of woo-woo, hokey-pokey stuff. All right, so today, just quickly, I want to talk a little bit about what functional medicine is, just because I think it's good to hear. Um, and then I will talk about some toxins, some common toxins, what happens when we have those common toxins um, on or in our body. And then some of the important nutrients that are necessary as part of treatment. Also included in the objectives is some testing uh, that's available. So we'll go through that. So a lot of you know what functional medicine is, but I tend to practice what's called a functional family practice or functional family medicine style, where I have taken functional medicine and blended it with your standard primary care family practice. And so the idea is functional medicine is looking at root cause um, based on systematic evidence-based literature, how you can find root cause or assess things that have caused um, chronic illness or even uh, current new illness for someone. So basically they take um, all of the information they can gather from the patient, their history, their genetics, their biochemistry, their pathophysiology, they put it together and they personalize that to um, treat the patient. So that's really what functional medicine is. It's a systems-based personalized healthcare approach um, to looking at root cause. <clears throat> We also like to tell patients that the difference between a functional medicine provider and a standard allopathic DO or MD, which is your medical providers in general, um, is, is different in the sense that we tend to focus, if you were going to take the analogy of a tree, we tend to focus as functional medicine providers in the lower part of the tree, the trunk and the roots. And there's a reason for that. We, definitely need to um, send people out and get diagnoses, which would be your leaves and your branches and um, the upper part of the tree. So if I have a patient that has a heart problem and they have a kidney problem and they have a lung problem, those to me visually in this analogy would be the leaves, the trees, and uh, the upper part of the tree, the leaves and the branches, which is great. And we need that. We need those diagnoses. But the question is, what caused those? 
what what is making that tree branch and bloom the way it's <laughs> branch and bloom the way it's blooming and behaving so if you were the tree i would be looking now down below at the trunk and at the roots i'm asking things like lifestyle and sleep and relationships and stressors and things that might have triggered this problem or things that might be keeping it going and so that's where the functional medicine approach is a little different than just, hey, you have a diagnosis, go see this specialist. Hey, go see this specialist. Oh, that medicine for that problem. Oh, that medicine for that problem. That's fine and dandy, but that's more of a, um, you know, you have a problem, let's treat it, instead of looking at what's causing it or triggering it or even keeping it going. And so that's where I have blended the two worlds, um, but that's what functional medicine does. They really focus on the base of the tree. <clears throat> So I already uh, mentioned the difference between detoxification and biotransformation, but as people were joining, I thought, you know, it's always good to keep reminding. When you want to speak intelligently about cleaning up the body, you don't really want to use the word detox because in medical world, in the scientific and medical world, especially in research, detoxification really means the process of the body cleaning out things that you have brought in. And so that would be like drugs or alcohol. And so if you go to your primary care doctor, that's not me, for instance, and you say, oh, it's January, I'm going to detox. I'm going to take some herbs and sit in the sauna. They're going to look at you like, mm, you sure you don't need a referral down to the alcohol detox place? And that's not what you mean, <laughs> but that's what they understand. So I would prefer if my family members, and I'm referring to my SALT members um, and people that I work with and my uh, patients, would use the word biotransformation. You'll have a better dialogue. It'll be more respected, especially in the medical community. And what that means is basically the body is transforming a molecule that's either made by the body or that is brought into the body and changing it into a form that the body can get rid of or excrete. So it usually means it's going from a fat soluble to a water soluble compound. So that requires a big chemical process that we're going to talk about and how you can actually manipulate it. So that's what we mean when we say biotransformation. So now it's 720 in the morning and you are 10 times smarter than the mass population. Congratulations. So when you talk about toxins, you can have those that come from inside the body and you would think, well, why would I have toxins in the body? That seems to be silly. But as you go through any kind of um, production of hormones or uh, inflammation or if you have uh, gut bacteria, they all produce stuff that we have to clear out. And that would be considered a toxin, especially if it built up and built up and built up and became a problem, it could cause some damage. So for example, uh, hormones, estrogen is a good example. There's a couple different types of primary estrogen. So let's use estradiol, for example. Both men and women have estradiol. It's a very fat-soluble, fat-loving hormone that needs to be changed into a water form of that estrogen so that we can pee it out, poop it out, sweat it out, and even somewhat breathe it out. So if you can't change the fat-soluble form into a water-soluble form and it gets stuck in any part of that process, whether it's a deficiency that's causing it or, or a metabolism error genetically or there's something interfering with that process, that can cause problems because if your estrogen, estradiol, stays in a fat form, it loves fat. Fat loves fat, so it sucks up into fatty tissue. Well, estrogen-dominant cancers like breast cancer are driven by that form of estrogen. So now you can see, even though it's a good hormone, we need it, it helps make good bones, helps keep our brain sharp, it makes our skin look lovely, it helps with reproduction. If it stays in the wrong form, even though it's made in the body, it can become a toxin and really bad and harmful. So there is a process for the body to clear these things. If you bring things in from the outside, those are called exotoxins, so, um, or xenotoxins from the environment. And that would be things like, y'all could think of obvious things, chemicals, medications, things we put on our skin, et cetera. <clears throat> One of the things we have to be clear about um, in, in, general, in general, when you're toxing toxic effects of something, like if they make a reference range for a heavy metal or if they make a reference range for a pesticide, they're actually talking more about a lethal dose and they call it LD50. Lethal dose means that it would take 
however much of this toxin um, given at one time to kill more than 50% of the population. So that's really where we're getting our standards as far as what's allowable in, um, in the environment or things that we're exposed to. That seems to be excessive because I don't want to be part of that 50%, by the way. <laughs> The other thing that you have to understand, there's another um, point of view that's, I think, slowly been gaining momentum um, and uh, respect in the literature. It's called toxic body burden or total body accumulation. And so it's how much of something, even though it didn't, you didn't swallow a lethal dose of a pesticide, for instance, maybe you didn't gulp down enough to kill 50% of the population, which ultimately would probably cause a big, bad, toxic yuckiness in you. But maybe you had a little sprinkle here, a little sprinkle there. And over time, it starts to accumulate in the fat. That would be called a toxic body burden or an accumulation over time. So there's two different things that we talk about when we're talking about toxic exposures. And what I was taught and what most of people in, in medicine really refer to as a toxin, they're thinking lethal dose, what's it gonna take to kill this person or at least 50% of the population, and that would be bad. But some people have symptoms when they accumulate little bits over time, and they're starting to realize actually this plays a bigger role than we thought it did. So it's important in conversation. So we talked a lot about um, things that or how you can biotransform, biotransform things, in other words, changing them and how that's important. But these are some more of those types of toxicities that people talk about and I think are really misunderstood, especially when it comes to medicine and health. So heavy metals play a role. And we'll talk about how mold or even the chemicals that are produced when mold, which is normal in our environment, mixes with say paint or smoke or sheetrock or whatever, when they start to mix and play together, they produce these toxins called mycotoxins that can make certain people sick um, or can affect people's health. Chemicals, of course, those are obvious. Stress can be a toxin producer. Inflammation obviously can produce toxins. We'll talk a little bit about that. Common allergens, and then of course, pathogens like yeast, bacteria, and viruses. So this is just a visual, I'm a visual. So some people will say, well, how in the world does it get into my body? I eat clean, I do this, I do that. Well, it can be from drinking water, it can be playing in the dirt, it can be eating fruits and vegetables because it's sucked up through the, the ground. Um, it can be, something can be put into the air and be considered not a lethal toxin, but by the time it gets transformed by condensation and then into the water and then evaporation, it's totally changed the structure and it's become more and more potent. And then we drink or absorb it because uh, we're swimming in the pool or Lake Erie or whatever it is. Um, so there are ways that you can get it into the body, uh, probably more ways than we think. And that's a visual of that. This is an interesting comment here. Uh, I just wanted to kind of reiterate that polychlorinated uh, biphenols are pretty popular. People can buy um, containers that say that they are, you know, like PBA free, which is a, a similar um, or chemical. But those are things that people look at. And now they're starting to finally starting to report things in the literature that say, hey, this might be affecting people. For instance, um, these chlorinated biphenols and organophosphates can really affect the cardiovascular system. And they're actually showing how now um, but this PCB, which is a common uh, polychlorinated biphenol, actually showed a elevation of the bad cholesterol because it oxidized the, the cholesterol. So it made it into even more toxic cholesterol. So that could be a really bad problem for people with heart disease. Um, so now they're starting to set criteria for this. But the sad part is they said, hey, you can have about this much and be okay. Well, now they're realizing maybe it shouldn't even be set at that level, it should be nothing. But we do have quite a bit of these polychlorinated biphenols <clears throat> in the system or in the in the environment. Something that I, I have learned more and more about, but our cosmetics are one of our um, most toxic things that we can put on the skin. And that I think also includes things like Vaseline and, and really heavy um, petroleum-based chemicals. And sadly, you know, I lathered that stuff all over my kid's skin when they were little, because that's what I thought we were supposed to do for dry skin. But those are really uh, pretty toxic. And so they can, 
interfere with the body's ability to absorb oil, um, uh, fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K. So it really uh, does a lot of nasty things. It also interferes with estrogen um, metabolism and so forth, but it's really important that we understand that it interferes with even our nutrient absorbance, absorption. Um, also, parabens are really not so great, and they're in a lot of um, skin products, especially your um, shampoos and uh, skin uh, sunscreen. There's a app called Think Dirty. That's why I actually put this slide on here. I wanted to remind you all that you can go to a lot, several apps like the Environmental Working Group is another one that has, uh, so it's ewg.org um, that have things that list uh, recently reviewed cosmetics. You can look for sunscreens that are clean. You can look at the Dirty Dozen, the Clean 15, which I'll explain here in a minute. That's going to be clean foods. And they do a pretty regular review and they're not funded or um, I would say there's a less bias because they're doing it for themselves. It's not for anybody else. They don't have any funding coming in from, um, from some of these makers. So there's less bias in my opinion. Um, another thing that we know is in a lot of our, especially the, our hair products and our skin products is pro uh, propylene glycol or ethylene glycol. And so those are pretty nasty and they can cause everything from skin problems to kidney or liver abnormalities. Um, so if you have trouble with skin, especially like eczema and things like that, really look at what you're putting on the skin because the integrity of your skin is not as healthy as it should be and its ability to filter some of the stuff out and to metabolize it and, and just protect you from these um, toxins is really impaired. So that's something I would think of if somebody had trouble with skin. Be careful your products are really clean. Um, also in pregnancy, uh, they've done a lot of studies where they've looked at the uh, umbilical cords of babies and they can see, um, looking at my time, we better hurry, uh, how much has been found in a baby's umbilical cords. And there's a list of things on here, plastics and uh, mercury and pesticides and lead and so forth. Flame retardant, it's a big one. We see that on a lot of our urine tests that we get. Uh, lead can lead to brain impairment. It uh, causes some uh, neurological issues. It's very, very toxic. It's stored in the bone, and as we age, we get increased in bone turnover when we lose our hormones. You'll see dumping of lead, so that, that can show up later. I talked a little bit about the Dirty Dozen Clean 15. Environmentalworkinggroup.org will constantly update their list. If I had to choose what I needed to spend my money on in the grocery store and I wanted to buy organic, I would buy the ones that are on that. If you see that Dirty Dozen list there, everything on the Dirty Dozen list I try to buy organic because those are the ones that sucked up more of the pesticides, insecticides, and fungicides than I would like to eat. The Clean 15, I can buy usually regular and feel fairly safe with what I'm eating. So I use this list quite a bit um, to kind of navigate my shopping and keep myself on a budget. Um, <clears throat> I will give you a little tidbit. Over 90% of the non-organic citrus fruits contain fungicides um, that now they know are linked to cancer and hormone disruption. Um, that was in 2020. And then 95% of all tangerines, for example, that were tested in, by the USDA in 2019 showed this uh, fungicide called Imazil. So just, it's not that we can't eat, but know what you're eating and then how do we support the system and the body to clean it up is really where we're going. And I'm going faster for time sake, so we'll just keep on trucking. This is just a visual pesticides crossing the intestinal uh, uh, layer, the protective mucosal barrier, and then how it finally gets uh, taken back into the muscle and the fat tissue, et cetera. We talked about exotoxins versus endotoxins. Um, you can have exotoxins in the body. Those are things that are made outside the cell as well, and they can be made by bacteria and so forth. You can have endotoxins that are made inside the cell that, that cause problems with disrupting the outer membrane of the cell. So you can also have those toxins that are made in our body that are doing things uh, at a cellular level, or you can have xenotoxins that are coming in from the environment. So we've got a lot of toxins coming at us. We've got to have a good cleanup system. This is one of my favorite, oops, sorry, my favorite visualizations. And I'm going to come back to it again. But basically what you're looking at on the side of the picture, the left side of the picture where it says toxins, this is your lipid soluble, whether it's made by inside the body or brought in from outside of the body, 
This is your fat soluble toxin. It has to go through almost like a factory process through a couple of phases where it gets changed into that water soluble form so it can be excreted. It requires, if you kind of squint your eyes and zoom in there, it requires quite a bit of nutrients, cofactors or vitamins, amino acids and minerals to get that thing all the way across and get it changed into that water soluble form. So if we're not eating really well or we're depleted for some reason, you can see there might be an impairment in this, um, this process. I, I think of it as a factory, um, <clears throat> taking a box all the way through a factory um, process plant and then making it into a new packaged you know, product. Well, if your workers in the middle are kind of sluggish because they don't have what they need or they didn't get a break, then you start getting stuck in the middle here and then I'll cause some recirculation. And you can see the picture there. It says, the more you recirculate, the more secondary tissue damage, the more free radicals you're making, reactive oxidative species you're making, that's gonna require more neutralization, which requires more cofactors, which are vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and antioxidants to clean up that mess. And the process keeps going. Well, we get more and more depletes. So it, it's kind of a catch-22 when you're, when you're nutrient depleted. The other thing that I wanted to show you is this is looking at heavy metals taken up by a wheat plant. It gets transported inside the cell. We take that in and then you can see how it's starting to affect the entire uh, inner workings of the cell, especially at the mitochondria level. Heavy metals really interfere. This is a picture of the Krebs cycle where we take our energy sources from food, we break it down in to make ATP and makes us have lots of energy. Um, but if you look closely, you can't see what's in there, but the red bubbles are where they've studied uh, heavy metals like lead, mercury, aluminum, and so forth, and arsenic. And that's where they interfere with our body's ability, our cells ability to produce um, ATP energy. So the less cellular energy we have, the less repair, the less detox, the less we feel well. Um, so that's really important. Estrogen disruptors, and this can be everything from uh, plastics to petroleum chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. They really cause a lot of hormone disruption. Um, so you can take a picture or a look at this picture here. They're looking at glycophosphate and a few other um, pesticides uh, or chemicals, and they're just looking at uh, some women in their plasma samples. And they noticed that <clears throat> there was quite a big change in the uh, aromatase process of their hormones, and it was disrupting this um, the process by disrupting the estrogen receptor. So it blocks it, it changes the shape of the DNA, and it even is interfering with transportation that we know now. Here's the mold. Um, just wanted to show that when you inhale or ingest or are exposed to the toxins that are produced from mold. So if you look at the top there, there's something called aflatoxin, orcatoxin, um, mucosaurin. Those are all metabolites that are produced by these molds. And those, if they get ingested or if they get uh, inhaled, can cause disruption in the tight junctions. And so we have less protection. It also triggers a lot of inflammatory response. And I have learned over the years that some people are more susceptible to this than others, but it totally has been shown in the literature that it should be a very big disruptor um, for many people. And so that's just showing you some uh, oops, processes there. This is that zoomed in, you have your epithelial cell lining. These are the toxins that come and trigger an immune response at the bottom. And you can see the body's recruiting all of these macrophages and these these inflammatory uh, cells and these big front fighters, and that's just creating a lot of inflammation for a lot of people. And remember, I, I told you that inflammation can cause toxins as well that we have to clean up and get rid of so that we don't hurt or cause more cell damage. So it's really important to, to consider and note when you have a really ill person that possibly is exposed to mold toxins. What can we do? There's a lot of tests and it looks like alphabet soup to me. You're, uh, this is just a funny little saying. It says your OCPs and your PCBs and looking at your CBC. Um, OCPs would be your um, organochlorine pesticides. And then of course, PCBs is polychlorinated biphenols. Those are just chemicals we're often exposed to, but it can affect someone's white blood cell count it can affect their platelet count. So you can order a basic CBC as a primary care physician and you can see 
uh, in some patients that have been exposed to especially these two types of chemicals, about a 14 to 15% drop in white blood cell count. So when you get someone that has a low white blood cell count chronically, and there's no other reason you've done the workup, you've ruled everything else out, I think you probably ought to start thinking about toxicity. And so that's a, a really simple, uh, shown in the literature over and over to be a really great way of looking at possible toxin exposure. It can also cause basophilic steckling. So if you've ever had a red blood cell, um, a CBC done, and, and somebody said, oh, you have funny shaped red blood cells. That's another thing you should be thinking of is toxicity. So these are, that's a very simple, less than $20 blood test that can be used as a primary care physician to give you some hints. Um, these types of uh, toxins can cause everything from uh, vision loss, uh, neurological changes, uh, hormone disruption, um, and of course, immune dysfunction. So that's a simple test. There's a lot more tests that we can do. You can look at inflammatory markers, that's your CRP levels. You can look at insulin because insulin is um, oftentimes a response to a stressor. And so you can start thinking, oh, well, maybe, maybe this person's insulin production increases um, because they have a receptor dysfunction due to these PCBs, which is shown in the literature to that. So maybe a person's insulin resistance isn't because they're eating bad or they're uh, sneaking the sugar or cookies, but maybe it's because they've got a lot of fat stored uh, PCBs. So you start to rule that out. You want to do all the basics first, of course, and then you start to really dive into root cause, what's happening underneath those branches and trees and leaves to keep this problem going if all the basics seem to be normal. So you can see some other things on here. Glutathione is another one. You can order that at a standard lab. That's a whole blood glutathione. Uh, if it's low, there's a problem. You need a lot of glutathione to clean up mess. Um, it's like your Zamboni. It's going to be your big cleaner upper. If you put a, a Zamboni out on an ice rink, it turns it nice and smooth and restores it back to normal. Well, glutathione is a is a pretty much like a Zamboni in my mind. Um, you can do urinary tests. You can look for heavy metals. You can look for chemicals. You can look for even the toxins produced by molds. Now, these are not commonly used in medicine because environmental medicine is actually a field that's pretty rare um, and it's getting more and more information and more and more literature and more and more um, credence in the medical community but it's not a common uh, practice and so if you test a heavy metal for instance in the urine most people are going to say well that doesn't mean anything because the blood level was normal blood level for heavy metal for example as we're, we're taught to test it's the only thing that we're supposed to go on blood level um, is the first thing we test for for a heavy metal toxicity that's going to be what's been the person's been exposed to recently so it's an acute toxicity well sometimes i'm looking for what's been stored in the tissue what's been stored in the bone because it's interfering with this person's atp production with their ability to detox etc so i'm looking for the accumulative type of total body burden and so that's different um, that would be done in heavy metal urine test uh, looking at metabolites and direct measures of that uh, and also even sometimes hair, not as good as urine though, in my opinion. History is what also helps lead me to the appropriate testing, so make sure you get a good history on the patient. Um, ATP is always um, on my forefront, mitochondrial function. If you don't have good mitochondria, you do not make good energy at a cellular level, you cannot repair, you cannot detox properly. You never detox someone that has impaired um, mitochondrial function. In their history meaning they're really tired all the time they don't recover from exercise well you want to really make sure you lay a good foundation for those patients first viruses it's a hot topic in uh <laughs> in the media right now so i thought i'd throw that in there this is showing how viral rna can cause some toxicity and affect the immune system that the body therefore has to uh, regulate and clean up another fun one we know uh, now that some people have a variant genetic mutation how am i doing in time um, that has to do with EMFs uh, causing some toxicity. They're very sensitive to these electromagnetic frequencies, and it's a, a genetic mutation called CACNA1C. Um, so anyway, that's just some new literature, but some people are more sensitive to that, and it can be very toxic, very sleep-disturbing, uh, hormone-disrupting. So what can we do? Some of the basics is get outside, get fresh air, good sleep, hydration, and sweat. 
Uh, I think everybody knows this. We just need to sometimes hear it. Our body is mostly made up of water. So if we're not hydrated well, uh, we don't clear toxins well. What else can you do? My first thing that I say before you do any detoxification support or clearance, you want to lay a couple good foundational pretenses. Number one, you want to make sure they have good gut health because if you start detoxing, if that is one of your largest elimination organs and the bowels are not moving, you can basically just cause more havoc. You're going to have some more circulation, recirculation of toxins back into the body. The second thing you want to make sure you do is make sure your nutrient levels are optimal. The better you have those levels, and I'm circling them here in the red, you can see B2, B3, B6, B12, glutathione, branched-chain amino acids, very important for the first phase of detoxification. In the middle phase, in the middle, when you get part way um, changed from fat soluble to water soluble, you have a middle phase, intermediate phase. That also is dependent on some of these antioxidants, real powerful antioxidant group, CoQ10, uh, bioflavonoids, vitamin E, A, C, all very important there, zinc. And then as you truck on through your detoxification pathways, the second phase is called conjugation pathways, and that's going to require a lot of amino acids. It's where your glutathione really jumps in, um, sulfur jumps in here, methylation activity. If you have any genetic impairment there, it's like taking your factory pathway going along, going along, and you've got six lanes all the way through, and all of a sudden your six lane turns to two lanes and things start backing up because genetically you have a mutation in, in say the glutathione or the methylation pathway. That puts a little bit of a burden because as it slows the process of, of detoxification down or biotransformation down, it causes some uh, reactive oxidative species and those require a bunch of nutrients in the middle to neutralize. If it doesn't happen, it recirculates back to the bowel and back through the system and it tries it again to keep trying to repackage it to get it to more and more water soluble. So it's really taxing on our nutrients um, as it goes through this process, especially if we have any genetic variants um, or little tiny mutations in the DNA that interferes with those enzymatic processes. Here you're looking at the uh, Krebs cycle inside uh, mitochondria and it's using glucose and, and some uh, nutrients to make some energy and you can see all of the parts that, that play a role there. Genetics, I mentioned quickly, but I'm going to come back to this topic in one of our other educational series, but these are some of the common ones when you think of uh, biotransformation or detoxification, glutathione pathway, the methylation pathways, the magnesium, uh, the ton of people have a uh, magnesium deficiency because of a really common SNP, um, and then the phase one detoxification pathways, that first part of that process through the liver, Several people have some pretty significant mutations there, meaning that they require extra enzymatic support, cofactor support, which would be vitamins, minerals, amino acids, nutrients, and also help getting it out in other ways um, to metabolize everything from hormones and um, medicines, et cetera. So a lot of good literature on genomics. That'll be one of our, our topics that I slip in here in this series of six. Okay, so I'm open for uh, questions now. I really sped through that fast. I'm sorry it was quick, but I wanted to share a lot of information. Uh, so any questions? Jess? Okay, Dr. Herbst, it looks like we have a couple questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, is it unhealthy to live near a golf course because of the pesticide sprayed? So yes, I, actually, um, yes, and there's a lot of good information out there uh, regarding that subject. Um, but yes, I've actually detoxed quite a few people that have lived on golf courses. I've had a couple of prostate cancer patients over the years. I've had someone that had a really severe fibromyalgia, and we ended up doing a urine um, chemical toxic test and showed a ton of pesticides and uh, insecticide spray or insecticide chemicals and we detoxed them and they, their pain actually got tremendously better. And then the cancer patients, it was just part of their protocol to sort of clean up the system. Okay, it looks like Heather might have a question. I don't... Okay. So oh, here's one, it says, is it unhealthy to live near a compost facility? Yes, same principle. Uh, a lot of the mold, I've seen mold from compost facilities, I've seen pesticides and insecticides. Again, it goes back to that picture. When you're breaking things down, 
you might be helping it to agree, but you also have a lot of metabolites that are off-putting into the environment. You know, it goes into the air, goes into the clouds, that changes moisture, that changes temperature. When you change temperature of any molecule, whether it's cold or hot, you change the structure. And so the testing on one chemical now becomes a totally different, potentially a totally different chemical. And so anyway, yes, I would say anything that puts off chemicals is definitely a potential risk. I would, I would think so, yes. Uh, Heather has a hand raised, but I'm not sure what to do. How do I do that? She said, once you have optimized gut health, is there a common panel that you would run, run after for toxicity? Yeah, so in an ideal world, you would uh, you fix gut or, or at least give gut a lot of gut support. You'd make sure they have frequent, regular bowel movements, full evacuation bowel movements. Um, and there's no sign of uh, malabsorption, digestion issues. And then you would really ideally check full nutrient panels. So vitamins, minerals, amino acids, antioxidants, especially CoQ10, glutathione. And then once you have worked on optimizing those levels, at least for a couple of weeks, then you can go into, you know, biotransformation support. You're already supporting the process of detoxification when you have healthy bowel movements, when you're sweating and when you're adding in basic nutrients. You're already doing and giving the body what it knows how to do already. Sometimes we need a little extra work and a little extra help, but as a general rule, you're already doing that when you do those first two steps. Okay, uh, another question, is mold sensitivity accumulated? So some people don't clear mold toxins well. Um, it goes with pretty much anything. There's a genetic a part that plays a role in this and we're learning more and more about it it is a fairly new field um, but mold illness for some people is pretty significant and they do believe the toxins are stored if not cleared properly yes they see it uh, get, getting across phospholipid membrane for example and causing um, inflammatory reactions like nrf2 to be upregulated and that causes a lot of inflammatory uh, toxicity and so it may be more of an indirect expo uh, cause. So you get a toxin from mycotoxin exposure causes an inflammatory process. The inflammatory process has to be cleaned up just like any other toxic load. And those patients typically are behind the eight ball when it comes to cleanup. And so that's where they're getting the presentation of illness. And so we don't know, is it just the toxin itself or is it really more that inflammatory response that's going on? And we're still learning, but that's how I approach it is kind of both because I don't know um, it's, it's a new, new field. Does our intellect's DNA uh, provide any answers of that kind of stuff? Of, of yes, yes. Our, um, the DNA panels that, that I tend to use, the genomic panels that I use, it's not a DNA panel, it's a genomic panel. The difference is these are mutations and enzymatic processes that you actually can do something about. They're not full on deletions that cause like Down syndrome or, you know, uh, that sort of genetic profile. Genomic testing is what we can manipulate and do something about. And yes, there's a toxicity panel, there's an inflammatory panel, there's nutrient panels that really do help me direct a detox process for people. Absolutely. For me, for instance, I have really tough time actually producing and metabolizing glutathione. And so when I started adding in glutathione when I was really sick, I noticed I felt better, but I didn't really understand why. Um, and certain forms are better for me than others. And over time, when I finally got my genomic panel, I noticed, oh, that's why, because I don't even make it. Um, that's why my levels always stay low. So anyway. uh, We have another comment. Um, it seems that even organically grown foods are still exposed. I can no longer eat fruits with the skin, itchy, tingly throat, um, only peelable fruits. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and I, I would agree. I think, unfortunately, yes, um, unless you you can say 100%, you've, you've grown it in a greenhouse or whatever, it's going to be pretty tough um, to say it's 100% clean. But you can definitely make cleaner choices. Now, people that have reactions like that, from the outside skin could also be, be reacting a they call it a um, cross contamination reaction. So if you're allergic to certain pollens that are in a fruit that's grown in the pollen season, it may be actually more because you're getting exposure to the pollens or the allergens of that season. And so if you desensitize the person from that, then they tend to be able to tolerate um, the skins and so forth as well. So it could be um, more complex than just it's because of the uh, stuff on it. 
it's confusing, I know. I think it's eight o'clock now, and I know everybody probably has to go to work. I appreciate your time. Hopefully it was a good educational series, um, and I uh, look forward to seeing you guys on the next one.